With New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap and the Hall of Famer Matt Miller and via telephone Nate Kane, who is a candidate for Congress, the seat uh, that Alex Mooney currently holds. Alex, of course, is running for Senate, so he's not running for re-election in Congress. Nate, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Hey, uh, I got uh, some stuff from your folks who said that you have some concerns about one of your competitors for this congressional seat, Riley Moore, and his ties to the Podesta group. What's behind that? Well, a lot of people are not familiar with the Podestas. Uh, they may not remember, but uh, the Podesta group, of course, was a big lobbying firm, you know, down in uh, Washington, D.C. And, uh, of course, uh, John and Tony Podestas, uh, who were, you know, running that, um, you know, John Podesta was Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. And that's something that, you know, I think uh, a lot of people don't don't know about. They may not understand what that is. And to me, what's more of a concern uh, in these kinds of you know political races is when you have somebody who's been a lobbyist before that now wants to be uh, a congressman you know it's uh there's a term for that they call it the revolving door and of course uh, uh you got to wonder about you know why that hasn't been something that's been addressed uh you know it seems to have been kind of covered up and hidden um to me if it's something that's not an issue then bring it out in the open and talk about it and that way uh, people can get their concerns uh, met and, you know, you can answer questions. But um, but that's something that has been uh, known by a few people, but it hasn't been, you know, a public part of the discussion. And, uh, and I think that people do need to be concerned about uh, people's backgrounds. It's not just that, but it's also, you know, like I said, um, you know, lobbying, I think, is a big problem in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and I think that's something that uh, people need to consider. I've been interviewing Riley for, well, since he started running for office. So maybe that goes back 10 years. I'm not sure. Maybe longer. I don't know an exact date. Uh, but it was never any secret that he used to work for the Podesta Group. It was one of the things that he actually discussed, one of the first interviews I ever had with him. Uh, I think it was listed on his resume and such. Um, but I don't know that it's necessarily a requirement that every time you do an interview, you bring up the fact that, hey, I used to work for the Podesta Group, Nate. That seemed, Nate, that seems kind of like a reach to me. Uh, no, I agree. I don't think that's the only issue that should matter. I think that, and more importantly, is uh, you know, substantially uh, what you've done since then. I do think that's important. Uh, I think the problem is, though, is that uh, you know, oftentimes, like I said, I think the the bigger issue to me is uh, this you know issue of having folks who have worked for lobbyists and who have you know been foreign registered agents and things like that. Uh, when they're in political office, especially down in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, that should be a concern. And so I think one of the questions that people need to be asking is how do you separate that? I can tell you one of the things that I'm going to do, and I've never been a lobbyist, but one of the things I'm going to do anyways, and I think it's important, is uh, I intend to, um, you know, any lobbyist that wants to, to talk to me, if, uh, if I'm elected, I'll be happy to talk with them, but they're going to have to agree uh, for that conversation to be made uh be recorded and be made public. Uh, one of the problems that I think that most people would agree is that there's a lot of corruption in Washington, D.C. And it's not just a matter of, you know, not being a, a corrupt individual, but you also have to do things to allow for greater transparency and make sure that that uh, people understand, uh, you know, the positions that, that you've held and the things that you've done in the past, you know, with your jobs and things like that, and make sure that people are assured that you're not going to uh, use those connections and things like that to basically um, do what a lot of politicians have done, which is to get rich off of their positions in Washington, D.C., or to get cushy jobs with a lot of these lobbyist firms after they leave office. John Gilstrap. Having worked for a lobbyist in, in my past, I will tell you that, that obviously when we talk about lobbyists, we autom automatically think about graft and corruption. And I'll stipulate sure. that some of that is there. I will stipulate also that that's not what we did. Um, we were lobbyists for the recycling industry, actually, and it's astonishing how little politicians or the public knows about that topic. There are many, many, many topics about which politicians and the public simply have no in-depth knowledge. That's what sure. lobbyists do. 
it's not a bad word. It's they, they are focused and knowledgeable in their particular field. And of course, they, they try to sway legislation that will support their field. But it's not a negative thing to be a lobbyist. It's a negative thing to to be, you know, to participate in bribery. But that's not what's really happening with lobbyists. Lobbyists are experts in their field and they try to educate politicians to make them smarter about those fields. I don't understand what's, what's wrong about that. No, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a lobbyist, and I agree with you. I think there's a lot of lobbies out there that actually support things that I would support. You know, of course, there's the pro-life lobby, pro-gun lobby. I absolutely want to meet with them. But what I think is missing in the equation here, and this is not just with lobbyists, but it's with, the, it's with Congress altogether, is there's a lack of transparency. And, uh, you know, a perfect example of that is, of course, Congress, uh, you know, they, they authorized the uh, Freedom of Information Act, and they had that apply to, uh, you know, the members of the executive branch, and they had that apply to the members of the judicial branch, but they did not make it apply to themselves. And I do see that as a problem. And so what I intend to do is to, you know, to basically lead by example. And so uh, I will make sure that uh, my office is transparent. Like I said, I'm not going to not meet with a lobbyist, but I think that the conversations that we have should be public, and I think that they should be uh, – uh, something that people can see, you know, what's going on in the conversation. And that way it avoids that appearance of evil. It allows for uh, the public to know about uh, where I stand on the issues, not just what I say, you know, in a public you know, setting or on the campaign trail, but they'll, they'll know where I stand by those conversations that are had and the things that happen. But uh, uh, I don't think that lobbying is a, a crime. It certainly shouldn't be because uh, there are industries that do need to educate these guys. Like, you can't be an expert at everything and be a you know, politician. But the problem of somebody who's a lobbyist before going into office is that it puts into question whether or not they should recuse themselves from several of the votes that they're likely going to have to take. And so I think there's a lot of questions there. And I don't, I'm not trying to accuse, let me make this clear, I'm not accusing Riley Moore of being a bad guy or of being a you know a bad person as a lobbyist or anything like that. I'm just saying that I think there needs to be greater transparency about all of these things. And uh, I'm glad to hear that he's actually we've had conversations with him about that before. That's good to know. Matt Miller. Nate, you're talking about transparency in the process. So let me just ask, what are some of the other issues uh, as far as legislation itself, things that are going on right now within the House that have you, you know, uh, desiring to run for this position and, and things that you would like to see done? Uh, you know, speaking of transparency, of concern that I have right now for our nation is that it seems that within the Justice Department, within the FBI, uh, within the intelligence community in general, uh, that oftentimes things are cloaked behind classification where they overclassify things so that way they can keep it from the public. Uh, I myself uh, have seen, you know, obviously as a former uh, FBI whistleblower, I've seen where they've abused, uh, you know, whistleblowers uh, who have brought, you know, complaints forward in a legal fashion and, uh, you know, brought things through the IG or brought things to their uh, members of Congress and where, uh, the FBI has clearly retaliated. We're seeing this in a lot of what came out of those uh, weaponization hearings. And I think that's important, uh, that, that public disclosure is important as to what's going on. But I would like to see some actual action. And the biggest power that the Congress has is the power of the purse. And so I do uh, think that they need to uh, withhold funding, maybe not necessarily from an agency altogether, because, like, for example, the FBI does a lot of good work in addition to some of the stuff they do that I don't agree with. And so I do think that they need to line item some of these budgetary you know, issues. Uh, I don't believe that the FBI should have a, uh, a domestic intelligence uh, arm. Uh, I don't think that they should be utilizing the tools uh, that, that are actually part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, for example, Section 702, which is coming up for renewal in December, uh, everybody needs to be contacting their, you know, their members of Congress and needs to be asking that they not renew this thing. It's been abused since day one. There was a federal district uh, uh, judge who put out a statement, I want to say it was about a month ago, that there was 257,000 illegal uses of Section 702 against American citizens, most of whom were 
uh, connected with the uh, January uh, 6th event. And so I think, you know, these things are important issues about our constitutional rights that are being violated and about the shredding of the Constitution, which uh, seems to be happening quite a bit, uh, you know, by these federal agencies. And so I do think that that needs to be reined in. Nate, severely. on that note, we have run out of time. I appreciate yours today. Let's get in touch again soon. Thank you.